Hello and welcome to our webinar. This is Terry Roberts. I am with Destinations International. We are the Professional Trade Association for Convention and Visitors Bureaus. And we are so excited to have you here today for this most important industry topic. Meeting and event security is everybody's business. So I do want to, as we begin, um, ask for you to enter your questions for our panelists in the question box. And Elaine Rosquitz from our team will be sorting through your questions and uh, holding them to the end. So I we would love to have good conversation um, and make this interactive for you you at the end of the webinar as well. So thank you again for joining us and it's so exciting to share uh, the knowledge of this great panel of experts we have uh, convened today. So I'm just going to introduce them each quickly. Um, first, let me welcome Mark Carrera. Mark is the Director of Education for International Association of Venue Managers, IABM. And Mark is responsible for developing and implementing I ABM's education program, and uh, he, as part of his duties, teaches situational awareness mindset training aimed at giving venues the tools to be safer and more secure. And then in addition, uh, Mark, I know you are the Director of Education, but also represent the Department of Homeland Security of Infrastructure uh, Protection through the Public Assembly Facilities Subsector Council. And then as part of that group, you work in collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security and the Protective Security Advisor to assure that all this information is provided to protect our public facilities assemblies and all the critical infrastructures involved. So Mark, uh, your expertise is so welcome here and thank you for joining us. Then I'll move- Thank you, Terry, I'm glad to be here. Yes, great. Then I'll move to David Dubois. David, um, the president and CEO of the International Association of Exhibits and Events, IAEE. And he is responsible for the management of his full-time professional staff, uh, producing the annual operating plan and overseeing the support of all the meeting of government units, leading business development and directing the association's fundraising efforts as well, as well as advocating for the industry and the organization's members. You also serve, David, the as the association's representative with industry coalitions, and, and I think this initiative is such a good representation of those partner organizations and how you pull important industry strategic alliances together. So, David, thank you for in, in joining us. My pleasure. And then our friend of, and a great representative from the Fort Worth Convention and Visitors Bureau, let me introduce to you John Seichel. John has been with Fort Worth um, since 2007, formerly serving the Irving CVB. And he is a long veteran, I won't say how many years, John, of the industry and has worked in many sales positions with Fairmont, Hyatt, Lowe's, and Regency Hotels. So he has a, such a great sales background that he brings to our discussion today. So gentlemen, thank you. Um, we look forward to this webinar. And let me just kind of paint the picture of where we're going. Um, I think that we can all um, be, I guess, taken back, saddened by recent events, and I think it had so much to do with why this uh, webinar was so highly uh, registered and, and attended today. We look forward to talking about the EMSS initiative and, and what these gentlemen are doing in terms of their work for our industry and how we can partner together to work more safely, and welcoming John also to talk about how CVBs can really help you in every destination to bring the right partners and the right players into your safety and security conversations. So with that, I would like to go ahead and turn controls over to Mark and allow Mark and David to begin the discussion. Yes, yeah, good day, everybody. This is David, and um, I want to thank everybody for participating. I think Terry told us that there are close to 600 ladies and gentlemen on this call. So given the uh, recent uh, activities and challenges we've had in Vegas and, and elsewhere around the world, 
uh, certainly uh, safety and security is a critical um, conversation that all of us are doing on a daily basis. About 16 months ago, I had the pleasure of attending the MPI World Education Congress in Atlantic City, where I met up with uh, Kevin Olson and Eric Rosenberg with uh, Keyway Security Advisors, where they uh, pitched me an idea on how we could uh, pull together the entire industry uh, to develop a safety and security initiative. So with that, I immediately approached our good friends at IABM, Brad Main, who's their CEO, and Mark, uh, and ESCA, the Service Contractors Association, Larry Arnaday, and certainly went to my board of directors. And I asked the question to all of those uh, folks, uh, how do we protect our $283 billion industry and the millions of attendees, exhibitors, workers, uh, participants on a daily basis. So we came up with the framework uh, of MC, which is the Exhibitions and Meeting Safety and Security Initiative, with the triumvirate leading organizations being IAEE, ESCA, and IABM. And Mark will tell you a little bit later on in the presentation uh, uh, that uh, we have uh, over 60 organizations that are supporting us, including PCMA, ASAE, DI, and the list goes on and on and on. The whole premise behind this initiative was, as I mentioned, number one priority is to enhance safety and security to harden targets at convention centers. And by the way, this program is focused on convention centers in its initial stage. And Mark will tell you about what IBM is doing in audit with auditoriums and arenas and festival sites. But we're also having side conversations with the American Hotel Lodging Association because uh, hotel ballrooms, uh, whether it's uh, any of the major chains or, you know, very, very big exhibition and convention centers like uh, Mandalay Bay, Sands, the Gaylords, et cetera, uh, Big High, it's been Big Omnis, uh, the list goes on and on. We wanted to make sure that we, we are inclusive and that all of the guidelines that you're We'll hear Mark uh, take us through uh, today um, are going to be available in a uh, in a developed state that we can take to the American Hotel Lodging Association and work with them to take it out to our hotel community as well. So what we did is we developed a strategic approach and objectives that I'll uh, quickly outline. Number one, establish recognized national guidelines. This is the first time an industry has worked with the Department of Homeland Security Safety Act Office to develop industry-wide suggested guidelines and best practices. And we understand that this has to be a shared, developed from the industry for the industry approach. So we developed a, a security, industry security council uh, called ISC to help us write and validate guidelines. And I know that Mark was in our first meetings and all our meetings since, but I think we started out with about 150 draft guidelines based upon the current DHS Safety Act Office um, application. For those of you who don't know DHS Safety Act Office, please Google that, uh, go to their website, and you'll hear more about it from Mark in a moment. So we brought together 40 ladies and gentlemen that represented various um, uh, stakeholders like convention centers, service contractors, event organizers, meeting planners, security experts, and DHS staff. And we created, uh, established, and created consistent and accessible template of guidelines, smart, and best practices to establish a certification program. And Mark will give you the status of that in a few minutes as well. Well, I don't need to remind everybody why safety and security is so important. Extremists are all over the world. We need to embrace and find solutions to harden our targets. Um, I mean, there was a incident just yesterday, once again, uh, in the Maryland area where you had a lone shooter. Uh, and so how are we going to do our best to prevent and try to uh, what we call mitigate? We're never going to totally prevent, but Mark will emphasize this as well. How do we mitigate uh, and keep things from happening uh, just by raising the conversation and raising all of the hardening of our uh, of our uh, venues. So that's kind of the overview. Uh, the Industry Security Council, as I mentioned, is the industry's voice, developed uh, guidelines and drafts 
We have a little over 80 that are in final vetting at this time, and they all align with the DHS Safety Act office. Once again, uh, developed by the industry for the industry. So Mark, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about Safety Act certification and DHS and maybe even give a little more background than I gave. And once again, I, uh, I'll be quiet now and Mark and John will take over and we thank you for your time today. More importantly, we thank you for your commitment to get out into your communities, work with your convention centers, your hotels, ask uh, the meeting planners what sort of safety and security plans they have in their, in their protocols and practices, and let's make our industry safer. So over to you, Mark, and thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, I truly appreciate you very much. And uh, again, I would like to welcome everyone that's on this on this webinar. I think it is uh, we're at that point in life now where it's, there's an element out there that wants to disrupt our daily lives. So it's real critical that we all come together to figure out what are the best ways to mitigate those risks. Um, I will echo what David said. Yes, we we do have a um, you know an, an obligation to protect uh, pretty much a 283 billion dollar industry. Um, that involves millions of people that attend meetings, conventions, and, and exhibitions um, every day. Um, what we have done is obviously we live in a in a very dynamic threat environment that's comprised of of homegrown violent extremists. We know that there's the lone wolf actors, there's emotionally disturbed uh, persons, there's the criminal actors, and the always present threat associated with workplace violence. But regardless of group orientation, ideology, or motivation, these actors target public assembly venues in similar ways by conducting simple low-grade attacks against large crowd concentrations while exploiting, our, of course, our media coverage. They're taking advantage of that. So the ideology is to conduct attacks against a range of soft targets like convention centers in the United States with little to no warning at all. And again, they urge federal, state, and local authorities as well as private sector security partners to work closely in their security planning and response protocols. However, event planners and organizers are and should be an integral part of that of that planning process. Um, Terry, if you go to slide 11, and thank you for uh, scrolling through these slides for me. Um, our, right now, our number one priority of our membership is the safety and security of our attendees. Our members, stakeholders, and the employees and the public that attend meetings, conferences, and conventions to include exhibitions every day around the world. And we all recognize the need and potential for greater collaboration and to address this priority. And given the current transitional threat environment and the growth of homegrown violent extremists, it's become clear that we must establish guidelines, as Dave said, for convention centers and other, and other related venues around the U.S. and align ourselves with, with the Department of Homeland Security and the Safety Act Office. Um, the Industry Security Council, uh, which is created and, and it's represented by over 40 diverse industry leaders industry organizations, convention centers, service contractors, event organizers, and premier law enforcement and security professionals from around the country are here to develop security guides to assist with the security guidelines or the development of the security guidelines while we work in close partnership, obviously, with the Department of Homeland Security Safety Act office. Um, slide 12. Okay. The, uh, one of the things that we talk about is is obviously MC. MC, as Dave said, the exhibition uh, meeting state security industry basically is the conduit um, for organizations and individuals to participate in that shared responsibility of, of as Dave said, addressing industry-wide needs for safety and security. And MC represents that opportunity for companies and individuals who have benefited from the industry's growth to just give back. The more organizations and, indiv and individuals that contribute to the safety and security of our of all of our venues, uh, in particular convention centers throughout the U.S., um, obviously will um, will provide us with the tools that we need to better uh, identify and develop what are the guidelines that that based on the current vulnerabilities, what are those guidelines that will help us mitigate those risks, and what what are those best practices? And again, it's a collaborative effort amongst um, amongst the uh, the uh, throughout the entire industry. Um, one of the things that we talk about is, um, obviously, when we take a look at the, the organization and organizing of events, um, as, we, as we continue training and advocating for a collaboration of training, we talk about the importance of, of what you're looking at right now, and that is, what are those best practices in regards to performing risk assessments 
You know, you want always always want to include a security representative in, in those meetings. So when you're when you're identifying site evaluation, you're parking and security. Do we have the checklist in place uh, when you're planning these uh, these events? You know, you should always prepare a checklist of security questions. Do we ask for evacuation plans um, in cases of, of emergency, and and do we have access to them? And what's what's our role as as meeting planners, organizers, exhibitors? What role do we play in regards to those evacuation plans as well? Um, from a crowd management perspective, you know, when we talk about the different crowd types and and also guard force requirements or uh, your your law enforcement presence. Uh, your security presence, what are those requirements, and how do we work in collaboration with those groups uh, before planning these, these events? Uh, key is, as you all know, as everyone knows, based on what's currently happened, um, we, we did provide training for the Mandalay-based staff. And one of the things that we talked about was the, the importance of, obviously, um, your emergency exits. And obviously, that's, that was, that, that's always been, been a concern is, you know, how are these folks going to exit? Because obviously we know that ingress and, and egress, the points of, of entry into an event and the points where they exit the event, these are these are critical right now. Because we know, as I sit on the DHS uh, council, we talk about uh, right now the threat level, with the current threat level as it is, um, the target of choice right now, obviously, are large crowds where they enter and exit these events. So what part is a, as, a, as an organizer or as an event planner what role do we take in identifying and being a part of that and identifying those emergency exits in, in the event of emergency? And then of course the access for EMS or first responders, do we ever, you know, what's what's our role there and how involved are we uh, with developing those coordinated efforts? I will say that the best example I give you is, is when we talk about the incident in Las Vegas, um, if you were to take that incident a year ago, um, that emergency response wouldn't have been as coordinated as that was. They really did a pretty good job in coordinate, coordinating that, that uh, emergency response. And a lot of that is based on the, the coordinated effort emergency planning that takes place with all the local, state, federal agencies and those that are a part of that event. And again, and then contingency plans in case of a, a bomb threats or power outages, you know, what role do we take in as far as the emergency plans regarding those contingency plans? And then, of course, the medical service plan addressing injuries and illnesses to include staging areas that have been identified. Mm -hmm. um, so those are those are key things that when you organize an event, that we should really look at. We've already talked kind of a you know we've identified MC. It launched uh, in 2016, and again, the whole purpose of this uh, the, the the mission was to protect this 283 billion dollar in industry and try to develop a base our baseline capabilities. Try to elevate those so. Kind of like uh, not post 9/11, um, the federal government came in and mandated a certain physical security measures, and a big part of that was because there was really nothing in place at the time to the level that it needed to be. So what we wanted to do was with MC is try to get ahead of that. Who who knows the industry better than than the industry itself? And so we felt if we could provide and identify what are those guidelines and best practices. Uh, so that we can protect our venues and our environments, and if we can identify those, um, then then we can provide that to the federal government and say, hey, here's here here here's all of our challenges. Now you provide us with the resources and the documents that we need to to protect those environments, and that's exactly what what is what is currently taking place. We developed the, the uh, obviously through the Industry Security Council the four subcommittees, and uh, these were work groups that were created to. To review and provide input regarding the guidelines. Um, we talked about portal design and we've developed a, an actual portal where we could house these guidelines. Purpose of this of this portal is so that ideally what we wanted to do was when convention centers and eventually other venues wanted to apply for safety act designation for that protected liability, we could take a lot of the legwork out. Um, we could actually provide the, the actual assessments. Um, we could help them with the entire application process. Um, at the same time, all of the resource documents that are needed to satisfy Safety Act designation would be in that, in that portal as, as well. As Dave said, there's over 60 industry organizations that are, are pledging support, and, and there's been over 2,500 work hours that have been dedicated to development of MC. We've conducted two pilot programs, one at, uh, in Houston and one at Overland Park. And uh, you know, when you talk uh, about these two awesome uh, convention centers, 
One is smaller, one is, uh, one is rather large, but uh, I'll tell you what, when we took a look at, uh, when we conducted their, their actual uh, uh, assessments, we determined that they were probably between uh, 90 to 95 fully in compliance to, uh, to be able to apply uh, the Safety Act designation. So they were pretty squared away, both of them. So we knew that, that uh, the pilot programs were probably gonna, were probably gonna go well. Um, currently, what we plan to do is submit, we've submitted the, I, the guidelines already. They're in the portal. We haven't submitted them for Safety Act designation as of yet, because as I said, one of the things I wanna, I wanna remind everyone is that these guidelines have got to be vetted by the industry. They have got to be vetted by the, by the industry. We wanna make sure that everyone has input so everyone has, has submitted their input, recommendations, and suggestions, and that's all they are. These are not regulatory. They're simply tools. They're simply guidelines that uh, they will provide, hopefully, um, uh, a tool or a resource for a lot of the convention centers and potentially other venues to become Safety Act uh, uh, certified. When you take a look at the supporting, the current supporting entities, there they are. The, I'm not going to read them out to you, but uh, between IABM, IE, and uh, ESCA. Uh, these are all of the supporting entities uh, that are strongly backing our current our current initiative. Um, so, and again, truly a, truly a pleasure to have all these folks on board and understand the importance of, of raising the bar to the point so we can start securing our, our facilities. We take a look at uh, some of the questions. I talk about questions that event planners should be focused on and should be asking uh, when they're when they're planning an event. We talk about training. The critical component is training. We want to train, 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 and as mundane as that might be, I always talk about the importance of programming the subconscious mind, feeding the subconscious mind with information, even though it becomes redundant so that it becomes mentally ingrained, so that these folks understand the importance of taking out the, uh, the, the lack of response and, and the thought process. And I always tell people it's like shaking someone's hand. You don't have to think about it. You just do it. Training should be the same way, but it's going to take uh, numerous types of exercises, uh, collaborative training with all of your all of your re the resources that you have available. But some of the questions that should be asked are: What specific training is is given to your security staff? Um, what's the safety and security What safety and security training have have general venue staff received, and and how recent was the training? Uh, these are key questions that I would ask as it pertains to training. When we talk about perimeters, exterior perimeters. Some of the questions that I would ask there are, are you paying close attention to exterior entry, entry points? How are you managing those? Are there busy areas outside of the perimeter? If so, where are they located? And how are you managing those? Do you effectively, effectively utilize resources to monitor these? For example, uh, bike patrols, CCTV, your closed circuit televisions, uh, and or contracted law enforcement personnel. How's that being monitored? And there's some key questions to ask as it pertains to exterior perimeters. Um, we talk about coordinated efforts in first responders. It's important that venue and obviously what we consider uh, your emergency responders work closely together and that emergency services are well informed and familiar with the loud and specifics of the building and immediate area. And some of the questions that I would ask there are how often do you invite law enforcement, EMS personnel, and fire department ser services to the venue? That's key and that's critical because again, they become familiar with your facility and the response uh, the, the response time is a lot is a lot quicker and, and more immediate. Um, the other thing that I would ask is when it comes to uh, you know guest services and frontline staff, um, things do do how often do you train your frontline staff? Are they inclusive in your training? What type of training are you providing them? Are you validate are you validating the importance of their role because they work those those outer concentric rings of a, of a venue? Um, so they're, they're a very key component to any, any organization, period. We know that drone policies, uh, you know, do, do some of the venues, they potentially have drone policies, right? What is the drone policy? Do you have one in place? What's the procedure for dealing with drones? We know that uh, a lot, so far, there's been a lot of hobbyists that are, that are, that are flying these unmanned aerial vehicles in and out of, of venues. But uh, always, uh, you always have to think, is this a test run? It's no different than we were trying to prevent hijackings. You know, a lot of the attempted breaches, uh, or um, you know, we, you know, are they test runs, or is this the real thing? So, so things to consider in, in regards to drones. Obviously, threat and vulnerability assessment is key as well. Uh, how often are those conducted? 
You know, how often are your emergency plans executed? Are you pulling them off the shelf and actually reviewing them uh, and looking over them? And these are questions that I would be asking, I would be asking in preparation for, for an event. And then of course, active shooter and workplace violence situations. Do you have an active shooter policy and procedure? Um, is, is that in place? Um, so that's, that's key. Obviously, you know, that is a, that is a critical concern right now uh, in, in the world today and that uh, we're having more active shooter situations than, than ever before. And it's, it's not gonna, it's, it's gonna continue for a while. And of course, crowd control. You know, um, when you have crowd control, where are your pinch points? Where, uh, where are the areas of concern in regards to managing crowd and who's gonna be responsible for that? Do you have personnel that are, you know, that are in charge of assisting uh, during an evacuation, you know, and, uh, and if so, who are they? Can you identify them and where are they gonna be strategically located? Um, and then of course, lastly, something that I would ask, which is just adds is, is the Venue Safety Act certified. You know, that's, that's also another thing that I would ask that just validates the importance of how they value the security of that particular event. So, and, and obviously the personnel and those that, that attend. Next slide. So one of the things I know it's, um, I, David, David, I know David Dubois knows that I can speak forever, but one of the things that I'd like to talk about is when we talk about training and the available resources, we know that you have the Department of Homeland Security that provides those resources. We know that you have FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Association. There's so many federal organizations that have training that's at, it's at no cost. You can pull it up online. Um, IVM, we currently have an academy for venue safety and security that focuses on four domains. And there's, there's another uh, place where folks come to, to, to receive really great training as it pertains to risk management, security operations, emergency planning and management and training. Uh, and that's held, that's held every year. And that's one of the IVM programs that, that we offer. We have just an absolute awesome faculty that really drives that, that curriculum to success. And, and it's, uh, it pretty much sells out the last, last couple of years. So, um, that's, we have a year one and a year two. If you take a look at the year two, there's, here's another opportunity that we want to offer as well for obviously meeting planners and organizers as well to be a part of this. Um, so we're structuring some of the curriculum and some of the things that some of the uh, courses that we're bringing in will also be structured and tailored so that the meeting planners and organizers will also have the opportunity to take something back in regards to emergency planning procedures when they, when they organize their events. But there's an example of year two. It's a more advanced risk management, emergency planning, security operations and training. And uh, this will take place in Minneapolis for, for those that are interested. And it, it's, it's filling up pretty quick, but that's, uh, we'll have the Academy for Venue Safety and Security, the Severe Weather Preparedness Training, and obviously a conference that's built on guest service. I always feel that guest service is, is, is critical to reducing levels of anxiety and mitigating risk. I always believe that you can uh, mitigate risk through, get through great guest service interjection. So we're bringing that as well, and we're just running those three programs so that, again, you get the guest service portion and you get the uh, security. So again, all of the resources that are available are out there. There's a lot of them that are at, at no cost. So uh, we tr truly welcome, welcome you to attend. And then of course, um, you know, IADM's annual conference and trade show, it's absolutely awesome, well received. And now we have all of the venues, all of the sectors under one roof. And uh, this past year, we were very fortunate to have some support from a lot of the federal agencies as well to include Department of Homeland Security. And a big part of this academy talks about the importance of securing your environments and all of those that should be a part of that. And so this year, the annual conference will have a uh, you know, very robust security portion, education component to it. And that's gonna be held in, in Toronto. So we welcome you to, to attend there. So it's the uh, annual conference and trade show. Um, at this time, I, you know, I, I, have, I don't have any other questions. I'll turn it over to you, Terry. Wow, I, I just can't thank you enough. I'm seeing the question board uh, lighting up. Uh, great questions and also some really tremendous uh, comments, Mark. So I know this is weighty material. We made the slides pretty condensed with a lot of information because we want to provide these to everyone after the webinar as well. But um, we will have Q&A after. We are um, rapidly uh, approaching the end of our time frame. But before we end, I really want to bring John Psycho into the conversation as our CVB industry representative. John, 
might you speak to the planners that we have uh, joining us today on why would they bring the Convention and Visitors Bureau into this conversation? What would be the purpose, um, both as they proactively plan in a destination, and then God forbid that they have to uh, reactively um, pull together the resources? Great, Terry. Thanks for uh, uh, putting this together. I'm glad that uh, Destinations International is um, taking initiatives like this and um, uh, having the conversations. I, I think what's important for planners, you know, to realize as well as, you know, CVB types that are on the uh, webinar is that, you know, we represent the knowledge experts uh, in the destination and have the uh, access to the key contacts. Uh, with people that are uh, here. Uh, ultimately, we serve as a liaison and the conduit, um, you know, and the, the, the Las Vegas situation, I guess, uh, is a classic case study of how to do this and, and how to respond and, and to be involved. Uh, they were the conduit um, providing feedback, uh, not feedback, but information externally to the public that they were receiving from the federal, state, county and, and uh, city levels in that uh, horrific situation that, that they recently experienced. Um, I think what else is important is that in most cities, and here in Fort Worth, we call it the Joint Emergency Operations Center, um, but there's probably some equivalent in everyone's city where a meeting is being held um, that is the collection point for a lot of what is occurring, uh, mm -hmm. things that Mark talked about. Um, we we are a part of that process uh, here in Fort Worth, and, and I would encourage the CBBs um, on this call, if you aren't already involved in that process, um, uh, one of the participants, uh, you need to be. Um, and in this way, then, you can provide that communication. You will be uh, one of the first you know, uh, to be hearing things and then can communicate effectively uh, to the uh, meeting professionals that are in your destination so that they can then communicate to, uh, uh, to their meeting attendees. Um, we, you know, it goes without saying that we can provide you know, customers with uh, timely communication. We probably are the ones that will know things you know more quickly than they would because of our relationship um, here locally um, and then we can also we have you know each destination should have a crisis um, uh, communication and management plan not just for security issues rel uh, relative to activities that are occurring in convention center or other event spaces in our community but things that may be occurring in hotels and hotel ballrooms. Um, how are you going to react internally and how are you going to communicate to the public and how are you going to communicate to your uh, staff in, in certain situations? So basically, you know, we are the voice of the industry, you know, for meetings, conventions, uh, events and trade shows in, uh, in each of our communities. And I think we're the best resource uh, for the meeting professional to know what's going on so that we can keep uh, not a lid on things, but that we can, you know, just appropriately moderate um, people's anxiety levels and, and the stress that is uh, uh, obviously occurring in times like this. Um, we'll, we will know what's going on and can share that so that they can share that with their attendees. Empowerment uh, is the uh, conduit for meeting professionals uh, relative to Destinations International. This is our platform that identifies um, contacts in all of the member destinations uh, for Destinations International. So you can type in here uh, the name of a city um, and state that you're going to be meeting in and the CVB in that area uh, will uh, pull up and then they, they will have the names of the CBB contacts and experts that are in that community, and then you can begin to use them as an initial contact point for planning a meeting as, or as well as for 
um, identifying you know what are the security elements that exist in the community that's great John thank you so much for representing um, our industry so well as you always do you know as part of destinations international core mission we really our goal is to connect planner professionals and our destination experts uh, join them in conversation to produce better meetings and events and our partnerships with our industry partners like IAEE and IABM allow us to continue to educate our members at our annual meeting as well. So it's, it's one big, happy, collaborative environment that we uh, work in and I'm just so proud to be able to have shared this amazing resource and information today. So we are going to stay on. We have a very full question board. So I would invite you, Elaine Rosquitz is going to tee up some questions for both Mark and John. I know many of you um, are anxious to know about uh, the CMP credit that you may have earned today. And it is under Domain C Risk Management. Next week, look in your spam folder because it does often in there but we will be sending to you via email a link to this presentation so that you may share it with your staff or your peers uh, you will also get the complete slide deck along with your cmp certificate and uh, you will uh, receive that midweek um, next week as well and you all have my information from registering my contact information so if for whatever reason you don't receive it um, please reach out to me and I will make sure that you get it. So thank you again so much for joining us. Um, we hope that you will join us next month. Um, we've got another great one lined up for you. We're going to really talk about something dear to I know all of your hearts and that is getting these attendees to your meeting. So next uh, month, um, November 16th, we are going to talk about five must do's if you're really looking to hone that increased attendance. So look for that sign up in your follow-up email as well. Um, I'll put our keep in touch um, points. I would really like to thank our sponsors at MPI and ePro Direct. And now I'll turn to Elaine Rothquist. Elaine, do you have some questions to field for our panelists? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Great job, uh, Mark and John, so thank you. Um, so the first question actually is for John um, in regards to, um, as an, as you know, from the CVB standpoint, as, as an expert and a resource provider in your destination, what are you comfortable providing to planners on say your destination website regarding safety in your community and preparing their attendees for general safety while in town? And it goes nicely with another question that was asked in, you know, the plan, the planner themselves, how much information should they ahead of time um, give out on safety and security? Or what is your recommendation on either of those questions? You know, Elaine, on our website, I think we just talk about safety in a very general way. And I think after uh, the events occurring in Las Vegas, as well as all the uh, discussion, relative to this initiative, we're gonna be re-looking at um, what we do in that respect. So I, I would say it's a work in progress for us. Um, beyond that, I would say uh, it probably, too much information, you know, can't hurt. Um, I wouldn't think that it would be a problem, you know, in, in trying to put as much out there as you can in a uh, concise uh, way that, that is, uh, you know, uh, receivable in a, in a uh, good fashion for customers. Great. Yeah, and then there's kind of a case by case in, in the planner knowing their audience and what kind of information, how they can send it out. And, and I think Mark had some great questions, you know, that for, uh, meeting professionals should ask, you know, when they are uh, considering uh, different venues. So uh, I think that's a great starting point. Great, thank you. Um, and then for Mark, what do you have any suggestions on what kind of, uh, again, a question from a planner, what kind of certifications or qualifications should a security representative have to be able to really come in and properly perform a risk assessment? 
for an area or a venue? I think that's a, that is an absolute great question. So one of the things is you have to understand that when you conduct these risk assessments, you want to make sure that you properly uh, validate and vet the uh, the actual company that's doing these risk assessments for you. Um, you know, as far as the specific criteria and certifications that they need to have, um, I couldn't give you those those details, but there needs to be some research done in regards to, um, you know, those individuals that are going to come into your venue to actually do a risk assessment or a threat assessment. And I'll tell you one thing, I would really recommend as well that, that the Department of Homeland Security provides a, an assessment as well. Um, and and they do a pretty good 30,000 foot assessment of your of your facility and a big part of that is in the event that there is crisis they're able to respond and have an understanding and knowledge of your that particular structure or that that venue but uh, definitely properly vetting your your whoever it is that you're going to third party out to come in and do your assessment is is critical great um, another very detailed question had to do with any plans for how to deal with general, you know, general service contractors, and and they listed the numerous people that come in and out when setting up a huge show, and the and the, the places they have access to, you know, kind of the the worries there, or how to deal with that lack of being able to maybe have them constantly going through security, but they're there for days setting up. Any that, thoughts on that? That's that's a that's also a good question. It, it can become a logistical nightmare because these. When you talk about uh, when you talk about these service contractors, they're coming in and out, and so uh, having proper security uh, access control, your access control measures in place, your pro your security procedures as these these folks enter, it can be a challenge because again they're they're in and out. Uh, I think uh, I think the key component is to focus on what your processes and your procedures are in uh, in working with those service contractors, but most importantly, I think is trying to have your you know, a really good understanding as to what your access control measures are and your credentialing is also also key for those service contractors. So focusing on those two areas would definitely help. And I can I can give you a list of specifics as well uh, offline if anyone is 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 interested. Great, wonderful. Okay, so Mark, this might be um, a rather broad question, but however you want to address it. Someone did ask, what did the EMSSI pilot programs look like? So again, rather broad, but if you want to touch at all on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so basically we brought in an actual, it was a third party that came in and assisted us with the pilot programs. And so they did a complete evaluation of, of uh, approximately seven or eight different areas, different domains, and from access control to credentialing to uh, freight and cargo to perimeter security. And, and so basically identified you know, once those those the, the best practices or the guidelines were developed, they basically looked to see exactly how they align with with the current guides as they were. Now, obviously, we've gone back in there and we had to tweak and refine those, and we're still working on on, on the finalized uh, uh, guideline. But the two pilot programs, they you know, between Overland and Houston, they they fared very well. If I if you know if I if I had the third party review in front of me, I I could definitely share the specifics, but uh, and I'm more than happy to share share that information. But these two convention centers were, uh, you know, in regards to their their all of their security measures that they had in place, you know, really squared away to to include the communication side of it. Um, there were just a few things that that the, that uh, you know the third party found that they could possibly tweak, change, or adjust. And I, it's, it's my understanding that those adjustments uh, were made. So uh, again, the, they fared really well uh, through the uh, third party uh, piloting that we did with both convention centers. Wonderful. Um, I think Mark, a lot of the last questions, I can sum up almost in one, you know, lots of interest. Um, how can people get involved? Uh, actually, this one you would be able to answer specifically though, is this only a USA as they're calling an initiative right now, or is there any Thing available out there for Canadian on the international level. Um, so just how can they get more information on it as a general thing? Absolutely. One well, thing it is they can reach out, you know, they can reach out to either myself, David, um, or our CEO president, Brad Main, and we can have those, those discussions. I can tell you that um, I actually sat on a panel 
uh, an international panel, security panel, and when uh, the different countries, which was Canada, Mexico, um, Australia, these folks, the, they were part of this panel discussion. And when they heard about this initiative, they also want to be able to coordinate and coordinate from an international level as well. So that nothing's been developed yet. It's just been talked. So I think that depending on how this goes, I think we could ultimately have something that would, is definitely going to involve um, those those countries outside the U.S. That's Mark. Great, Mark. Um, I'm going to pass it to Terry. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I'm still just reading the question board with just awesome webinar. Thank you so much. Um, and then continuing to say, will we get these slides? And absolutely, you'll get the slides. You'll get the recording. Um, I also want to um, tell you all that if you would like to learn more about the NC initiative, you can just go to iabm.org forward slash EMSSI. And we'll include that link as well in our follow-up email. So gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining us on behalf of Destinations International. It was really our pleasure to host today to provide this important um, opportunity to come together to support each other um, to build stronger alliances. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.